How a musician saved the lives of hundreds of people on a sinking cruise ship. A story of bravery, leadership, and extreme cowardice. And is Wild Mountain Time an Irish song or a Scottish song? And guess which recorder player can be heard in a jewelry shop in the Highlands of Scotland? It's Pub Songs and Stories, show number 244. Welcome to Pub Songs and Stories. This is the virtual public house for musicians to share the stories and inspiration behind their music with your host, Mark Gunn. Subscribe to the podcast at pubsong.com. Greetings, gun runners and others who might be listening. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I am pretty excited. I did a uh, science fiction Harry Potter convention. That's technically not built as that, but it is a Harry Potter convention here in Atlanta last week, and it was fantastic. I did a live recording of the Pub Songs and Stories podcast, and I'm hoping to bring it out in a couple full weeks. I'm not exactly sure when, so stay tuned for that because things keep fluctuating on my stories in the days to come. It might even come out next year, but I'm hoping I'll get it done soon. In any case, I look forward to sharing that show with you. It's it's funny, when I started doing the Pub Songs podcast back in 2005, one of the reasons I picked it up was because I wanted to speak better while performing, whether talking on the mic or whatever. Fewer ums and ahs and whatnot, as you'll here in the podcast. And I feel like I did a better job than I expected I would. I have not listened to it yet, so I could be totally wrong. (laughs) But overall, I was really pleased with the episode and the live recording, the songs, the stories that I told. I thought it was a, a good show. And I'm looking forward to sharing that with you in the days or weeks to come. We shall see how that works out. But first, today's show is brought to you by my gun runners on Patreon. Thanks to Expat Fledgling, Crory Dempsey, Ryan and Kelly Melville, and John Moda. Over on Patreon, there's the new MP3 of Mingle Boat Song. There will be a version of Wild Mountain Time later this week, because that's the song I'm playing today. And a questionnaire to help plan my coffee shows. Basically, I, I'm trying to get your feedback. What songs do you want to hear when I play Call of the Kilt Father each Wednesday at 11 a.m.? And what's coming up? <laughs> I, I don't know if I can announce this, but I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> There's a very good possibility that I might have Lorena McKinnett uh, telling a, a little story for this podcast in the days to come. So if you're not familiar with her, she released an album in 1991 called The Visit, and they're doing a 20-year anniversary and they asked if she could come on the show. And I was like, well, yes. So they asked about an interview and I just don't do interviews. I there's still part of me is like, maybe I should, but then I know myself. I'm just not good with the interviews. Nevertheless, uh, that story will be coming maybe next week and maybe later. I'm not entirely sure just yet. I'm still waiting to hear back from the publicist. So we'll see what happens. But I do want to ask you, what song would you like to hear about for future episodes of Pub Songs and Stories? Drop me an email. You can send it to sing at pubsong.net. Upcoming shows Wednesdays are Coffee with the Kilt Father, and I'm doing one this coming Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. It is on all the video channels out there, most of them at least. And at the end of the month, I'm doing a Firefly Drinking Songs show at Gigabit's Tabletop Cafe in Marietta, Georgia. It's from 4 to 6 p.m. If you're free, come join me. All right, let's get on with the story of Oceanos. What would you do if your ship, if you were out at sea and your ship started to sink? Would you jump ship or do what it takes to save the lives of the hundreds of people around you? Paul Eastman is our storyteller today. He is the lead singer and songwriter for the Celtic rock band Coast. He tells the story of Moss Hill, a musician on a cruise ship whose bravery saved the passengers. MTS Oceanus was a cruise ship that sank in 1991. It suffered uncontrolled flooding. Her captain and some of the crew were convicted of negligence for fleeing the ship without helping the passengers who were rescued thanks to the efforts of the ship's entertainer. (laughs) But I'll let Coast tell that story. Here's Paul Eastman of Oceanus. Hi there, this is Paul Eastham here from Coast, and I'm here to talk about the story of the Oceanus. Just a bit of background about how I came across the story. It was actually just through uh, through a YouTube search, um, n- not directly a search on that particular ship, but just uh, I was always quite interested in um, 
stories where there was a a personal element to it. So, uh, you know, an individual that that could retell a story. Um, and looking through various videos on uh, on YouTube all those years ago, uh, I just stumbled across uh, this video, this uh, very small documentary about the the sinking of the Oceanus, but most importantly about the the people involved. Mentioning most uh, a guy called Moss Hills and, and another gentleman called Julian Butler, uh, but Moss Hills seemed to be uh, the guy that, w- that they were focusing on the most. Not exactly sure what was the reason for the the sinking of the Oceanus. Um, it, it wasn't actually that that captivated me. It was the personal element. So I remember the documentary that I was I was watching was very much focused on um, the storytelling of it from from Moss Hills, and uh, now Moss Hills uh, is a a musician. Certainly at that time, he was a a musician that was obviously playing on uh, fancy cruise ships, and uh, the Oceanus being one of them, which was a it was a Greek cruise ship, so I believe. And uh, it came into trouble uh, on on the, the southern coast of Africa. And uh, there was a, a huge problem, because usually um, when a captain would order an abandoned ship, it, it means that, uh, yes, you have to abandon ship, but the captain must stay with the... With the ship, that's the general uh, the protocol there. Uh, some led to believe, and when the when the captain ab- uh, ordered the abandoned ship, he he thought it meant himself too. So he he decided to to leave the ship, and and I think he took some of his his crew with him, got on a boat, and just left everybody on board to die. And I don't know how long it took for Moss Hills to realize that this was a serious problem. Obviously, they knew the ship was sinking, but there was nobody uh, in charge. Certainly nobody in charge of organising uh, how people were going to get off the boat. There was no help. So, I don't know what came over Moss, but there was there must have been some sense of, okay, there needs to be some leadership here. So, Moss Hills uh, went to the bridge where the captain and his crew should have been. They weren't there. Um, and I know that he radioed for for help, I think, through the Navy. And the Navy came and um, they must have been radioing backwards and forwards about how to organise the the departure from the ship so the, the all the souls on board, you know, how to get them off the ship. Um, but I, I wasn't sure about what the lifeboat situation was like. Maybe they'd all been used at that point. I, I, I'm not, not quite sure, but I know... That it was uh, it was part of the the documentary. I remember Moss Hill saying something about uh, there were people were leaving the ship in twos, so two by two, uh, they leave the bow. Hence, hence the lyric from the from the song two by two, they leave the bow. And the thing that really struck me is that all the all these things that Moss Hills was saying as part of the documentary were like lyrics of a song. They were absolute amazing one liners. Two by two, we leave the bow, you know, got a message for the captain and things like that. And these were all things that he was saying. And of course, I started writing them down, thinking this is really incredible, uh, incredible for lyrics. It was it was easy. And um, so. So, yeah, uh, you can see all this taking place on various videos as well. It was being filmed from not only on the ship, but uh, from. The, the helicopters or people on other boats that were surrounding uh, the Oceanus. And sure enough, people were, were leaving the ship and everybody had uh, eventually uh, gotten off the ship um, and rescued in, into these helicopters. And I know um, from from what I could see that Moss Hills was the last, the last soul to leave the ship. And uh, as, as he was in midair, you can see... You know, as he's getting winched into the helicopter, you can see that the ship just basically gurgles underneath the water and and disappears forever. It it was quite an emotional thing to to watch, actually. But but to comprehend something like that, to actually be there, must have been absolutely terrifying. But for somebody to just take control like that, um, especially someone that was 
more than likely regarded just as a humble musician. Um, that's what sold the story for me. Uh, that's what made it absolutely incredible. I think, for me, the story, had it been someone that was, uh, you know, ex-Navy and knew all about this stuff, it still would have been an absolutely incredible story. But I think the fact that it came from a musician that basically saved everybody, or two musicians... Uh, I know there's a Julian Butler was also... He's less mentioned in this, but he, he deserves credit as well. Julian Butler was also a very, very important role in this. I think he was also a musician um, working with uh, with Moss as well. And it's very interesting. I, I know that uh, everything that Moss was saying fitted absolutely perfectly uh, lyrically with, uh, with, with the song. And the song came very, very easily. It took me about five minutes to write Oceanus. It was it was literally a, a very, very quick demo. Five minutes to write the song and, and maybe 20 minutes to just record a quick quick demo of it down. Good enough for uh, for Coast to learn as a, as a song anyway. Um, yeah, it's one of those beautiful rare moments <laughs> that you have where a good, good song just comes to you and it takes no effort whatsoever. But the story itself was so amazing that it, it didn't require any any work really on, on my part to write the track um but yeah it's it's a story that never gets uh old never get tired of telling this or or you know um going into the details even in a concert situation uh it's yeah it's an amazing brilliant and fantastic story about bravery uh leadership and uh of, of course uh extreme cowardice as well and that's the thing as well about these types of stories. It's a bit like uh, like Titanic in a way because what it does is it puts you in that situation and, and makes you question uh, yourself, you know, where you, you think, what would I do if that was me in that situation? You think, what would I actually do? And of course, you know, we all have different different outcomes. You know, we would have done different things maybe. Or some of us, some of us may have just, gone along with with the ride and you know jumped into a lifeboat as soon as possible you don't know um but that's what a great story uh that, that's why like factual events in history translate as great stories as well because they they make you think that way and they put you in that position uh, where it makes you think okay if i if i was in this situation how would i have handled it and that's why i love the story of uh, the oceanus because it it certainly certainly does that well, it does for me anyway.
Oceanus is a new track from the Coast's newest album, which is called 10.2. And you can find out more about the band on their website. They also have a, a music video with footage from the ship as people are being rescued and it eventually sinks. It's kind of cool. And you can watch a documentary from the Oceanus on their blog. This again, this is from their latest album, 10.2. If you enjoy the band, the music, the story, please support what you love. The musicians on the podcast are happy to share their music freely with me and you. And you can find their music on streaming music sites, but streaming is a way to sample the music. If you hear something you love, these artists need your support. Please visit their webpage, sign up to their mailing list, and buy something. You could buy a digital download, a shirt, a sticker, a pin, a songbook, a jewelry, um, or even the classic physical CD. Your purchase allows them to keep making music. And if you're not into the physical stuff, many artists accept tips or... Many also are on Patreon. So again, please support the arts. If this show made you happy, you can also join the Gunrunners Club on Patreon. Your support pays for the production and promotion of my music and this podcast. If you have questions or comments, drop me an email and you can save 15% with an annual membership. All right, next time, like I said, uh, next time we're stepping back in time, uh, one of these two things is happening. We're stepping back in time where I share stories from how my music career began. It's all from that live episode of Pup Songs and Stories that was recorded at Conjuration here in Atlanta, or it'll be a Lorena McKennett feature, um, which I'm, I'm hoping that's when we'll go through in time. Uh, but I will let you know in the meantime, let me tell you my story of Wild Mountain Time. Wild Mountain Time, also known as Will You Go, Lassie Go, is a Scottish-Irish folk song. Yes, Scottish and Irish. I don't care who says otherwise. <laughs> the lyrics and melody are based on the Scottish song uh, The Braes of Valweather by a Scottish poet Robert Tannehill and Scottish composer Robert Archibald Smith. They were adapted by Belfast, Belfast, Ireland musician Francis McPeak into Wild Mountain Time. Now, according to Wikipedia, Tannehill's original song was first published in Robert Archibald Smith's Scottish Minstrel. It's about the hills, Braes, around Bellwetter, near Loch Hernid, and Tannehill collected and adapted traditional songs. The Braes of Bellwetter may have been based on the traditional song, The Bays of Bowether, but I don't know what that song is at all. <laughs> McPeak is said to have dedicated the song to his first wife, but his son wrote an additional verse in order to celebrate his father's remarriage. Wild Mountain Time was first recorded by McPeak's nephew, also named Francis McPeak, interestingly, in 1957 for the BBC series As I Roved Out. While Francis McPeak holds the copyright to the song, it is generally believed that rather than writing the song, he arranged an existing traveling folk version and popularized the song as his father's. When interviewed on radio, Francis McPeak said it was based on a song he heard whilst traveling in Scotland, and he rewrote it later. Bob Dylan's recording of the song cited it as traditional, with the arranger unknown, though Dylan's copyright records indicate that the song is sometimes attributed to McPeak. And I'll be honest, I, I don't trust Dylan on this one. I know he, he took a, the song Patriot Game by uh, uh, Brendan Behan and you know, rewrote that one and gave no credit to Brendan. Uh, so I, I don't really trust him. I think he was trying to avoid paying copyright royalties. Uh, that's how I look at it. <laughs> In her book, Fragrance and Well-Being, Plant Aromatics and Their Influence on the Psyche, author Jennifer Peace Ryan describes Wild Mountain Time as essentially a love song with the line, Wild Mountain Time Grows Among the Scottish Heather, perhaps being an indirect reference to the old custom of young women wearing a sprig of thyme, mint, or lavender to attract a suitor. Rind also notes in British folklore, the thyme plant was the fairies' playground, and often the herb would be left undisturbed for their use. So as for me, I don't remember where I found the song, but it would have been when I started performing at Renaissance festivals, though possibly mp3.com. I just don't remember. I do remember Andrew and I worked out our first arrangement for the song, uh, we put it in on our 2000 album for the Brobnagging Bards called uh, Gullible's Travels. It was later re-recorded with a better version for A Fair to Remember, but it stands out largely because, in my opinion, of Andrew's recorder solo. It's beautiful, but it's also just a gorgeous song covered by many, many people. And the lyrics, just they just pop. They're just fantastic. And uh, just <laughs> those magical lyrics. <laughs> 
Now, one of my favorite moments for this song happened on my Celtic invasion of the Highlands of Scotland in 2013. We were staying in Aviemore, Scotland, in the Highlands, and I remember walking through a gift shop when I heard Andrew's unmistakable recorder playing, and my mind nearly exploded. <laughs> I searched the shop for the origin of the sound, and I found a small glass cabinet that had jewelry in it. Gorgeous jewelry made of compressed heather. There were necklaces, earrings, pendants, and brooches. It was just, it was really just fantastic. I ended up buying something for my wife. Then there was also this like TARDIS in my brain. It flashed back to me uh, an email that I'd received years earlier. A company asked if they could use our recording in their shop. So there it was, Broadway Nagy and Bards, or rather Andrew McKee, because it was really just the recorder part on repeat. In Scotland. <laughs> it was it was really cool. Uh, you can check out the company at heathergems.com. And, and I, I, again, their, their uh, jewelry art is just spectacular. It's beautiful to look at. So, In the summer of 2009, I worked out my own arrangement of the song for my CD, The Bridge. And that version also has inspired a lot of people. Again, it's one of my favorite songs on the album and to play. I love the song. But one of the things that made me so proud about performing this song is hearing my own improvement in singing it's one of these songs that as i got better vocally i developed a better ability to phrase things and how it's sung and each one i feel like still stands out as fantastic but it makes me feel really good about my own vocal abilities so all right without any further ado this is me singing wild mountain time i hope you enjoy it slancha Oh, the summertime is coming And the trees are sweetly blooming And the wild mountain time Rose around the blooming heather Will you go, lassie, go? And we'll all go together To poor wild mountain time all around the blooming heather Will you go, lassie, go? I will build my love a bower By unclear and crystal fountain And all around the bower I'll pile flowers from the mountain Will you go? Lassie, go And we'll all go together To Powaihod Mountain Time All around the blooming heather Will you go, Lassie, go I will roam the country o'er through that dark land so dreary And all the spoils I find I'll bring to my darling dearie Will you go, lassie, go And we'll all go together To Powaihod Mountain Time All around the blooming heather Will you go I see go If my true love she won't come I will surely find another To Powaihod Mountain Time All around the blooming heather Will you go, lassie, go And we'll all go together To Powaihod Mountain Time All around the blooming heather Will you go go Oh, the summertime is coming And the trees are sweetly blooming 
And the wild mountain time grows around the blooming heather Will you go, lassie, go And we'll all go together To pull I hold mountain time All around the blooming heather Will you go, lassie, go And we'll all go together To pull I hold mountain time All around the blooming heather Will you go Lassie, go Will you go? Lassie, go Will you go? Pub Songs and Stories was produced by Mark Gunn. The show is edited by Mitchell Peterson with graphics by Miranda Nelson Designs. You can subscribe and listen wherever you find podcasts. You can also subscribe to my mailing list. You will get regular updates of new music, podcasts, special offers, and you'll get 21 songs for free. Welcome to the pub at pubsong.com.